Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming here. And thank you very much to Kunsthaus, to Afbika, to Michaela, and uh, Barbara Gross, my gallerist who's here from Munich, who's always been very supportive, and Chus Martinez, who's not here, who kind of instigated this whole project. I'm very happy to have the chance to be alongside Shabnam. And um, Katya. yes, of course, to Katya, to all the other, Anna and the Ruth people. and Leah and all the amazing people who've hey. helped to make our uh, time in Hamburg so hey. memorable and comfortable hey. and joyful. So we're very grateful. Um, we have never done this before. So you are our guinea pig. I just warn you. Is the voice too tinny? It's, yeah, it is, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's okay, okay. I have to move my tail. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we came together because we are interested in uh, somehow a similar body of knowledge. Uh, we come to it from very different spaces. Uh, we got interested in the non-dualist wisdom traditions, uh, its philosophy and practice. These are living traditions. They happen to be oral traditions. I come to it from uh, Mahayana Buddhism as preserved inside Tibetan Buddhism, in particular following the Middle Way Philosophy School, Middle Way Consequence Philosophy School, and Shabnam uh, should I say something? Yeah, or maybe you say something. <laughs> um, and uh, Shabnam has been, um, uh, she has been doing this amazing project of very big national and international mm -hmm. importance, I guess, beyond boundaries, around the work of a mystical poet from the 15th century whose name is Kabir. Mm -hmm. But it's not just Kabir's poetry, it's the poetry of many different poets uh, who sing uh, songs of experiences, poems about seeing reality as it is, about the first encounter of the self with yourself. And I come to it from this very different space. So we are going to try and do some dance together tonight. And I will... Um, uh, the, the question is, uh, a lot of these traditions speak about awakening. And awakening implies that we are sleeping. Only when you are sleeping, then maybe you need to awaken because otherwise there's no point of awakening. And uh, they do posit that most ordinary people in their ordinary perception are asleep. They are not awake to reality as it is. Now, what is this reality? How is it that I'm asleep because I think I'm awake? Maybe most of you think you are awake that when we have conventional sleep, that's when we sleep and then you wake up and you are awake. But they say, no, you're not awake because your perception deceives you about how things exist, the nature of existence of things. So your cognition, your affect, your ethics, everything that flows through, it is having some kind of very mistaken foundation. And until you don't first recognize that there is this kind of mistaken basis, and then you find ways to change that, transform that, um, maybe we cannot have a very peaceful existence on this planet. So times are urgent. There is a lot of shit out there and in here. And uh, they say that basically there is this kind of dualistic idea of the self and the other. Whether that other is another human being or another species or another plant, there is this kind of binary split and relativity within which we are living. So there is this uh, very simple Tibetan saying which says, a six inch line is short relative to an eight inch line and an eight inch line is short relative to a 10 inch line. I think we all know about relativity. I don't have to go into that. So when there is long, there is short, they do not exist through their own nature. But we seem to posit that things seem to exist somehow through their own nature, 
more concretely and independently and not so relatively shot a shot. And it, give, it makes some kind of feelings arise in me and long is long, but long and short are merely relatives. So, there is a lot of emphasis on understanding what is reality. They posit that everything is in the nature of selflessness or emptiness. And emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. It doesn't mean just that something is simply empty. It is empty of a certain kind of objective existence that we so far think, yes, things exist out there. So the selflessness and emptiness and the self that they posit is not just the self as the I, myself, or you, yourself, but some idea that all phenomena have a self-entity. The chair has a self-entity, the musical instrument has a self-entity. I leave, the entity stays in the room. It does not come with me, it does not depend on me. So we're going to try and dismantle this a little bit from two different directions. Shabna, my hand to you. So, uh, so many of the songs that I've absorbed through journeys in the oral traditions of mysticism in India resonate with this philosophy and uh, the first song I thought I could share with you uh, comes from Rajasthan in Western India by a poet called Rohal Fakir. And he evokes this idea of waking up because this is a really precious life. It's a, uh, in these traditions, they say lak chaurasi. You're going to spin in 8,400,000 hundred cycles of becoming before you get this precious jewel of a human birth. And uh, so make the most of it, because this is your hour of waking up and receiving. We need a little less sharpness in the voice. So he says, uh, the, the head, the black hair on your head have turned gray, and you still don't change your ways of unconscious living. And uh, uh, isn't it high time you wake up? And uh, Waking up is about doing, about embodying this wisdom, not just talking about it. So, and it ends with this idea that we've been discussing in the workshop all day, which is that uh, if we have to come into an experience of the self that is not small, fearful, narrow, clinging to uh, small identities that get threatened because all our identities are pinned on dualities. So if I'm, uh, if I'm Hindu in India, I feel sort of important because I'm a majority there. And then I migrate to the US and in Trump's America, I don't feel so good. So uh, our identities are fragile because they need defending wherever they go from the external uh, limitless dualisms we are embedded in. So uh, Kabir and these mystics and Buddhist philosophy invites us to a taste of the self that is beyond duality. face, your true form, when your heart's duality goes. <laughs> all. I belong to everybody and everybody belongs to me. There is no other. <laughs>
Has a, has, a, has a very powerful image of our true self or soul, if you will, or spirit, is uh, a swan. And it has come from a very vast lake in the Himalayas called Mansarovar, which is the lake of the self, of the chit, of consciousness. And it's huge. And it comes into this earth and it forgets its way back. And then it hangs around with crows and herons and small ponds and puddles mucking about in the dirt, 
forgetting that it belongs to a much vaster reality. So we're often addressed as swan souls, invited to, to experience that vaster lake from which we came. I always worry that after Shabnam sings, who would want to listen to me? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, this very precious life that we have, that uh, very precious moments that we have here, very fleeting, very short, um, we all know about impermanence and uh, we think about it, we know we are all going to die, we all know we can't say when. Um, but somehow we don't seem to live with, uh, well, the vast majority of us, I'm speaking in broad generalizations, uh, we don't seem to live or really embody this idea of impermanence. Um, and one of the things that um, I began to understand was that, of course, we are aware of gross impermanence, you know, day changing to night, seasons changing, fall is here, next will be winter. But there is a very subtle momentary impermanence where things are arising, abiding, and also coming to cessation moment by moment. And perhaps it's this subtle impermanence, if we can get access to, then it brings some kind of urgency, um, not necessarily about doing, 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 but some sense of urgency that, yes, it's probably worthwhile to know what is reality and to go into a deeper investigation and analysis and to say, hey, I don't really perhaps know my own mind or how it functions, but it seems like my whole life I navigate and relate also on the basis of this mind. So in this philosophical tradition, people really went and studied what is the nature of mind, what is the nature of consciousness, what is the nature of all phenomena. And um, uh, one of my teacher always gives this example. It's, it's, a, it's a little silly example, but I think it really works, so I'll share it with you. Um, uh, <laughs> my teacher says, okay, let's say you, you want to make a new artwork or publish a book or you know, make this dream project and you need $100,000 to do it. And I come around and say, hey, I give you those $100,000 and then you're so excited about that. And then I say, but I can only give it to you for four seconds. And then it's kind of like, suddenly it's just like all the excitement collapses because you feel like it's so momentary. Four seconds, what good is this money in four seconds? What am I gonna do with it? So if somehow we realize that there is this kind of subtle impermanence that this object, which is mine, this person who I think I possess, all these material possessions that we hang on to, cling to, and we feel like somehow they also give us some form of security and you feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go and grab this thing. That thing is not that thing because every moment it's always changing. So somehow when we start to really embody and experience subtle impermanence, we kind of really relax about everything. You know, it's, I can't, this chair is not the chair of one second ago. You know, it's a completely new chair. The self is not the self. So impermanence is often very important, subtle impermanence, which is what the song is about, uh, to kind of expedite the journey of awakening, so to speak. I would like to go a little bit into what do they mean when they say that all phenomena is the nature of selflessness or emptiness? What does it actually mean? For which I have to do a small um, exercise or demonstration with you. Some of you who came to the workshop are already familiar with this. So I ask you to... What is in my right hand? Anyone? A bottle, okay. What's in my left hand? Nothing, okay. Can you imagine an imaginary bottle in my left hand? Yes, you can imagine, right? 
And so I have a bottle in my right hand and I have what in my left hand? An imaginary bottle. Yeah, an imaginary bottle, okay. So are we clear? Because I don't get much response, so I'm never sure, you know, if I'm talking to walls or, yeah, okay. So can somebody just, just throw ideas? How do you think these two things are different? The bottle in my right hand and the imaginary bottle in my left hand. Just whatever comes to you. I'm not trying to trick you. These are not like some deep philosophy questions. It's just really, just you can say whatever you like. Okay, you can't drink from the imaginary bottle. You can drink from this, it'll quench your thirst. Okay, so it has some function, yeah? What else? It's not heavy, it's light. I'm sorry? It's not wet, okay. Uh, would you say, uh, where does the imaginary bottle come from? Sorry? It's something your mind created? Yeah, you would agree? Your mind creates the imaginary bottle? Sure, it doesn't matter. Each one will imagine a different kind of bottle, but there is an imaginary bottle and you imagine it through the power of your mind. And this bottle, here, it has some substance. You would agree, yeah? You, you would say that you can somehow leave it here and leave the room and it's gonna be there. Uh huh. So I cannot choose. How you can? Wh what about it is an illusion? Yeah, maybe um, um, maybe the the thing I see is not in the bottle. Okay. <laughs> so uh, actually, the thing is that uh, it, we we say there is a bottle. Okay. I try one more thing. Just look at the person next to you, sitting next to you. Okay, I see that more or less all of you start to smile, yeah? Okay, now imagine you have electron microscopes on your eyes and you look at the other person and you see electrons, protons, neutrons floating around in the space. Seems like you still smile. <laughs> uh, it, it, somehow, uh, we, I don't know, like when you see the electrons, protons, neutrons, and you don't per se see the person, it's uh, less exciting, isn't it? It's like it's more exciting when you actually see the person, but if you are looking at electrons, protons, and neutrons, and you're not looking at the person, then you feel, okay, there's some stuff moving around in space. It doesn't necessarily excite me as much as looking at the person excites me. So somewhere we see that if I start to investigate, um, not if the bottle exists or not, or if the person sitting next to you exists or not, but so far in the world, mostly as we go about our lives, we feel like things exist from their side on their own, independently, they have some inherent substance. There's something there which is independent of me or my mind, and it's out there. And I uh, am always a subject in interaction with objects. All my emotions arise from this process. I like something, I dislike something. I'm indifferent to something. So through some simple, very simple analysis. So if I were to, because I have an idea that there is a bottle. There is some such thing called a bottle. If I zoom into this, I don't find the bottle. The bottle disappears like with an electron microscope, yeah? The bottle didn't change. You can say that I moved closer to it. My perception of it changed, but the bottle didn't change. So basically, by doing this, I'm trying to show you that everything more or less exists 
also with the participation of our mind. But we don't go around the world thinking, hey, my mind is involved in, you know, all this kind of labels and mental imputation that we put on all kinds of phenomena. So there is a kind of gap in the way things appear to our sensory consciousnesses, either sight or smell or sound or taste or touch. We feel like, okay, all this is just happening to me, but it's something out there, I am not participating in it. And this tradition then says, sorry, there is a gap and there is some mistake between how you perceive something, how it just appears to you, and then you just say, okay, that's how you exist. And they say, no, we have to analyze and we have to ask, is there some gap between how it's appearing and my mind agreeing and saying, yes, 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 you exist independently because actually if we try to investigate, this bottle has, how did it come into being? It was produced in a factory, there were laborers involved, the water was brought from some mountain spring, it went through some chemical treatment, machines were needed, sunlight was needed, microbes are there, and in that sense, all the laborers who made it, uh, they had to eat some food. So if we start to look how did this bottle come into existence, it did not, it, it depends on many causes and conditions even for it to come into being. And one of the most important conditions by which it exists, its mode of existence, is the mental imputation. So this kind of gap between how things appear and we just say, okay, this is how it appears. All ordinary people's perception, this is how it appears to them. And so far I've had no reason to necessarily go and say that, hey, my perception is mistaken. But as we get introduced to these ideas that why is this bottle empty of a bottleness? And this is the kind of analysis that we go through. So imagine that a philosophy as abstruse and tough to get one's head around like this now begins to flow in the oral traditions of poetry and song in central India. This next song I'm going to sing for you is from Madhya Pradesh uh, and it's a Kabir song. And it's very much about the ideas that Tejal is speaking about, which is to say that there is an, a realization that we have lived our lives getting really clingy and fixated to form. And we have invested form with all meaning. This tradition is inviting you to discover the dance between form and emptiness, nirgun. Uh, and when you discover that beneath the surface of things there is emptiness and then there is form again and then there is emptiness and there is coming and there is going and there's impermanence and there's rebirth, it's, it's a liberating philosophy. And uh, then you get songs that, that uh, share the joy of discovering this trick of knowing the emptiness behind form. So Kabir says, <laughs> Kabir says, uh, I realize that form is always dancing in front of emptiness. And when I realize this, I realize the miracle of perceiving life in a different way that turned everything on its head for me. Nirgun galiyan saankari mari heli ya to chadhyo nahi jaye. These formless alleys, these alleys or lanes of emptiness are tricky. They are difficult to negotiate, but if you do, you find your beloved. 
where is it rising and where is it setting and where is the light radiating and the answer comes it's rising here and it's setting right here you know what she was talking about your participation of your mental framework in the reality you think is very solid and fixed out there it's rising here it's setting here and this is where the light is radiating where is it thundering where is it showering where is the dry turning to green it's thundering here and here it is showering and here the dry is turning to green in this nirgun ke bazaar mein in this marketplace of emptiness uh i'm trading in diamonds in jewels of insight the sensible ones are striking a good deal in this marketplace of emptiness and the misguided ones like most of us are losing our capital in this marketplace of emptiness Hari hai vivo 
that country come to that marketplace of emptiness what is this emptiness and why should I come there um, I have to come back to this bottle <laughs> the imaginary one and the one which is not currently in my hand but it shall be so at first we, we, we definitely know that the imaginary ones comes from the mind, from the subject. But in the beginning when we started, maybe not all of you, but at a very unanalyzed level, this seemed to exist from the object and without the participation necessarily of the subject. So then when we start to analyze and we say, okay, I do participate for the existence of this bottle, how it exists, my subject, my mind is involved in that. Then I have to give you another, um, when we dream and when you are having an ordinary dream, when you are not lucid dreaming, and if you are having a nightmare, then in your nightmare, I don't know, it's let's say very bad, and then somebody comes and wakes you up, and then you feel like, <sighs> okay, it was just a dream. Where does this dream come from? I mean, very simply, is the dream coming from your mind? Did the mind make up the dream? Yes, okay, so the mind made up the dream, but while you were dreaming, you didn't, because you were not lucid dreaming, you were not aware that your mind was creating the dream. So whatever the nightmare was, was really affecting very badly because then you are very affected by the situation and you feel like, <gasps> and then you wake up and you're like, okay, that was just coming from my mind. So we seem to have a different emotional reaction when we come to know that something is coming from our mind vis-a-vis -vis that something is coming from outside the mind. It seems like if it's coming from the mind, we just feel a little bit more relaxed because you feel like, okay, it, it's just my mind. You know, it was, it's not a real war or a situation where somebody's actually trying to come to kill me. It's just from my mind, so I'm relaxed. But when we are out there in the world, we don't see the participation of our mind in how things are arising. So when something very bad happens, we are very emotionally affected. When something very good happens, we are very excited. And it seems like we're like these little puppets dancing, you know, like this curtain on the wind blowing like this, blowing like that. And then through this process, if you analyze and understand that your mind participates in all the creation and your perception of something is extremely playing a very important role, then you can start to change how you engage with things, how you react to things, and you start to feel, okay, I have some control over the situation. But for this, it becomes very important 
to start training the mind. And that's why a lot of these philosophical traditions are also wisdom traditions of mind training and a lot about the science of the mind. So we can actually, this emptiness of not finding the bottle when we start to analyze, the same thing will occur. That as you get closer to something to know its ultimate truth of how it exists, it seems to disappear. We can say that, okay, I didn't find the bottle, but I did find atoms. So whatever is the object you go for looking, which we go looking for in the beginning, it's just that that object disappears, you find something else. If you subject even the atoms to such an analysis, even they will disappear. So this not finding of some thingness which I so far thought it's there, there is some idea or a notion, then we start to see how we are participating in this. Um, this is an amazing book, How to See Yourself as You Really Are. It explains in very simple language a lot of the things that I'm speaking about and I highly recommend um, that, if possible, uh, to read this. So, in this tradition, there is a differentiation made between ordinary perception, which is actually not very valid because it does not have a valid basis, and then something which is a valid perception. There's a very famous line uh, from an iconic Mahayana text called the Heart Sutra, which says, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, emptiness is none other than form, and form is also none other than emptiness. So the form is right here. When I analyze it, I see the emptiness of that form. When I pull back and I zoom out, I see the form again. The object does not change. Just how I perceive it begins to change. If I analyze and see its ultimate truth, I don't find it. I only find the emptiness of its objective existence, the way I thought it exists. So this is like the hardcore uh, material, if I have to put it in a nutshell, in as simple a way as possible to communicate to you. And this is very important because with this, we start to dismantle this idea of the self. Because everything we do more or less serves the self, the welfare of the self. Even if we do self-harm, somehow we think it still serves the self. And as long as there is the self and the other, this net of um, care and unconditional love and also seeing that all sentient creatures want, we share something in common. So it's almost like the walls that define us also divide us and there has to be a kind of opening and extension to see what we share in common and how these knowledge systems can help us to make a small cognitive shift, a small affective shift, and step by step then we open into something bigger. So we'll end this with a short parable, a story that comes to us from uh, Buddhist traditions, as well <clears throat> as all good things in oral traditions like to flow and travel, it also comes to us through a Kabir song, the same story. And it's also found in, uh, amongst Native American tribes in South America, the same story. And what does this story tell us? There was a vast jungle with many trees, sandalwood, bamboo, many birds and animals. And there was a parrot who lived on a sandalwood tree that she dearly loved. One day, uh, there was a great forest fire that ravaged and spread rapidly like a blaze. And all the animals and birds began to flee. And this parrot didn't want to leave the tree, so she didn't fly. And the song speaks of the conversation between the tree and the bird. And the tree says, you fly, you have wings. I'll have to stay because I have roots. And the bird turns around and says, but I ate your fruit and I soiled your leaves. And I played from branch to branch. 
You die and I fly? You live and love just once. And so what does this parrot do? She goes and plunges into a lake nearby in the same forest. And she comes up over this blazing, raging, enormous, huge jungle fire. And she flaps her two little wings and two, three drops of water fall. And then she goes back to the lake, plunges in, comes out, flaps her wings again, two, three drops of water fall. And then she goes back into the lake, wets herself, comes back, flaps her two little wings and two, three drops of water fall. And the other animals and birds watching this are horrified. They're angry. They, they scoff at her and they say, what do you think you're doing? And she turns around and she says, I'm doing what I can. And that's where actually the story ends in the South American version of it. And it's been used by uh, uh, Vangi Mathai, the environmental activist. Uh, but in India and in the Buddhist version, it moves on because we have, we have more interesting things that are going to happen. I'm doing what I can. And she keeps at it, she keeps at it. Now she's getting black and charred herself. She's near death, she's, she's burning up herself, but she continues this jatan, this incredible devotion, dedication, passion. Uh, and the clouds are rolling by, and on the clouds, the Buddhas, or the gods, depending on which version of the story you're in, are just returning home from a party and lying back resplendent in the clouds and one of them happens to look down and he sees this bird doing her stuff and he converts himself into an eagle comes down swoops around her and he's like what is this bird doing and the god is so struck by the power of love in action that's Thich Nhat Hanh's term for this story love in action, that the God is incredibly moved and moved to tears. And when the gods are moved to tears, what happens? It rains. So this is a love story. <laughs> ourselves as the drop, the small, petty, paltry drop in this ocean? Or do we intuit the ocean in this drop? This is a Kabir poem where he says, That rare one recognizes the power of the ocean within, that connects us to everything. So here's the Marwadi Kabir song from Rajasthan telling this story.
Some questions, 
share some comments. Yes. Okay, I think we can both speak to it, yeah. So, um, the way I read this, if you are trapped in self-grasping and self-love and love of small, limited forms, small, limited things, it makes you a very, very, very fearful person. If, uh, if your sense of self is so uh, attached to your smallness, you're not able to have the capacity for fearless action. And you don't have the capacity to go beyond yourself, which is love. Love in its, in its larger, more manifest spirit. But when you're touched with nirgun ki chot, when you are struck with, with the inherent impermanence of everything that you think is very solid and yours and then it's, it's you, right? It's my identity, it's my things, it's my people, it's my share of the forest. Now it's going, I better flee, I better find a new, new place to be. If that's how you live your life, then you're not capable of love in action. But if you are struck by shunyata, you are free. You are completely free of clinging to things you never had in the first place because they weren't there anyway or they were going in everything is in a state of departure and impermanence and it's our inability to see this reality to see this shunyata that makes us stay fettered and incapable of connection and love does that Do you feel she's clinging to the tree or is she, she's trying to do something for the whole forest and the tree and she's manifesting her love for the tree and the forest? Do you think she's clinging or is she going beyond the self? Uh, can I also, I, I think you spoke so beautifully that I almost felt I have nothing to add, but maybe as you are probing further, maybe I have something to add, uh, which is to say that, um, let's say we set up three situations, okay? Uh, in one situation, a person is, two, okay. Situation one, a person is dreaming, and in the dream, they're doing very good things, yeah? Good meaning like, let's say, beneficial, like the parrot. Second, the person is dreaming, and in the dream, they're doing negative things. I don't know, harming others, I don't know, taking what's not their own, etc. I'm putting it in very blanket ways. And in the third situation, a person is awake, and then they are engaging in something good. So for me, the difference is that, of course, between doing something good or bad in a dream, we'd say it's still preferable, because in the dream you don't know you're dreaming. So you think you're doing something good, and in the dream, you're doing something bad, and it has, you know, its own sets of cause and effect repercussions. But both people are dreaming. And then you wake up. And then when you wake up, it's not that you stop doing. You continue engaging in whatever will lead to more wholesome cause-effect relations, but you're not any longer seeing what you're doing, you're not clinging to that doing in this way that this is objectively good. 
This is something inherently good in it, something inherently bad in it. So there's a, the, 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 the difference in the love that one uh, posits when one places this objective existence into other people, things, situations, is different from the kind of love that you have the capacity to share, which has no attachment, which it does not have a mistaken basis. So then that is the difference between the love that comes after a recognition also of the emptiness of inherent existence of things as opposed to a love which comes before that. That is more conditioned love. I know it just sounds probably conditioned love, unconditional love. These, these words have been used and abused so much that maybe they don't have that weight and currency anymore. But if we try to somehow really look at the reference of what these are saying, then we see that there is a different kind of basis. If I think that all this is happening objectively without the participation of my mind and then you do certain cause and effect, it's very different from knowing the mode of existence in a very different way. You know that nothing is, in, it doesn't mean that there is nothing or cause effect doesn't matter but you just have a completely different relation of engaging with things. There's much more expansiveness, and that's what I think Shavnam spoke of earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I've only come to this tradition maybe two years ago, but I think strains of it already started arriving in 2011, pre my work with the Documenta project. Um, there are two things I want to say as a lead up to your question, which is uh, the idea of creating an illusion within reality or the idea of creating an illusion within an illusion. So in uh, my understanding, I had a very different kind of ontological and epistemo epistemological reality that I was dealing with. And then within that, I'm like a magician, right? Creating, <laughs> magician, but I am an artist who's creating all these works to bring some other kind of references. But my basis of understanding all the, the very foundation of reality was very different. So one is this. Second is a lot of my work is, um, I would say it happens to also go past a lot of conventional borders. And I thought that they were very much transcending convention. And now I believe that they create new conventions without, within conventions. I have a very different idea of what it means to transcend convention and go into a more ultimate space. More practically speaking, as I started to come to this philosophy and as I grow into being an artist, I also realized that my work as an artist is not just the art product that I make, it's how I work. It's how I relate to every single relation within the process of my work. And of course, then there are lots of questions about medium. So for example, I don't know, the whole process of making Between the Waves or all the works which are there at my solo exhibition right now, it is very much about, the whole journey is about the path of least resistance and it's been done with a lot of love and care at every aspect. So I think with every kind of, in the process of shedding this small self, everything starts to change and it starts to reflect in the feeling of the work. And I feel people are touched differently. This is just my, I think it also changes one's mediums. Um, my sense of responsibility as an artist, you know, what is this small artist in this mega world of, you know, 
millions of conflicts and lots of violence and also some very positive initiatives. What is my role? What's my space? What can I do? It's very easy to feel like that small drop of water which is not going to make any difference and I feel empowered in a very different way to deconstruct the whole system from a very different angle which Western or modern education definitely did not provide me. Except that I think uh, I would mirror uh, or agree with the last part of what you said, that it, it affects the way you do things. Uh, it's really not so much how you, you show this wisdom in what you do, but how you embody the wisdom as you do, as an artist. And I think that's, that awareness is, uh, is really where the difference lies. I also want to say that I don't think I would be doing so-called lecture performances and workshops two years ago. That is also a new part of my, oof, I see it very much as part of my practice. And it's not something I had before. And it fits in very much with the oral tradition. There's a question there. Yeah, okay, please. No, no, go Bettina. Uh, uh, no, I would not say that, no, because actually when I started working on Between the Waves, it was exactly at that time in my research that I kept coming against Buddhism, non-duality, interspecies, interbeing, and I'd already started reading. I just did not have a very in-depth understanding, nor do I claim to have a very in-depth understanding still. But, you know, an encounter with the work, always you see something new, you read something new, you experience something new. But I, I don't feel that this per se has changed the way I would install it or, you know, no. No, because, uh, no. I, and I have, but I feel that work already has the basis of uh, the understanding that I just have in a much more deeper or articulate way now and I did not have it in those terms perhaps at that point. Please. Hear you clearly. Yeah. Can you come maybe, in front? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, these stories and these songs actually uh, dispel illusions. <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, the experience of singing these songs brings me closer to a, a sense of reality, a, a sense of uh, true reality, if you will, and a, a sort of unraveling of the knots of ego delusion that we typically lead our lives in. So that's how I see the, the, emerge, the relationship as a singer with these songs. I think maybe what I was saying is that uh, the mediums of film and video, if used with uh, realistic representational images, creates this, uh, you really can work very easily between so-called reality and playing with reality within the medium of film and video, because you're working, uh, I mean, at least in my work, like when I, see this particular video work, some of the channels, I almost have the feeling, okay, I see a kind of representation of reality in the sense that there are human figures and there are some objects and things that I recognize that match somehow things I also perceive in the world, but nothing kind of adds up to anything that I know per se as reality. So I these mediums by themselves lend to the, pos like, to the possibility of working with this idea of reality and non-reality or displacing reality, you can call it illusion or you know, maybe illusion is a strong word, but that's what I meant. That, but it doesn't mean that you do that to create necessarily further illusory, that the, you know, the meaning can, So I guess we can bring the evening to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you, Mario, yeah. for the help with sound. Yeah.